Okay, what I would like to do now is start to transition into uh, the mach machine learning -y part of what we were going to be doing in here, which I suspect people will find interesting. Um, but what I want to start off with at first is um, a, a, a sort of review of linear algebra, because um, basically uh, a lot of the machine learning -y kind of things and pattern recognizing -y kind of things that we do sort of assumes as input a feature matrix. And so, um, you know, so w in, in a feature matrix, you typically have the rows represent examples of things, okay, columns represent feature um, attributes, and, you know, for your project, basically right now what you should all be doing is building your matrix, okay? Um, for almost all of you, for example, who's got a project where they have, will have a feature matrix? Somebody, okay, you, and what is your project? And so what are the rows of your matrix going to be? So I think what you're saying is that the rows are going to be the different actors, okay, and the columns are going to be different features of those actors, right? And so um, this is the typical thing that in most projects things reduce to. Any questions? And so in order to start thinking about this, we need to know a little bit about matrices. Um, linear algebra is the mathematics of matrices. So what, what's good about linear algebra is that it gives you a uh, language to talk about matrices that is you know, very compact and stuff like that. And many of the, the machine learning algorithms are basically you know, line, you know, best either described in terms of linear algebra or understood what they're doing through linear algebra. Now, I'm going to assume most people have had an exposure to linear algebra somewhere along the line. But I want to review the basic principles because um, I was never a good linear algebra person. And so I found that I needed a lot of review to, in order to do the book, and, and we'll see if we get anywhere with it. Okay, so the first property of linear algebra that I think is important is that, they, that, that matrices can represent many different things. Um, you know... Uh, typically in our data sets, as we said, we have rows that are objects and, and, and columns that are, that are features. Um, in other cases, does anybody have a problem with they're working with geometric point sets? Okay. A common representation for geometric point sets is if you have a set of endpoints in D dimensions, the logical way to represent it is as N rows, one for each point, with each of the dimensions representing another column of the matrix. So point sets are logical things to think of as uh, matrices. Systems of equations, linear equations, are natural to think of as matrices. Often you've got a bunch of equations of the form, you know, some constant coefficient 1 times x1 plus coefficient 2 times x2. So if you have any of these kind of equations, each equation is a row, each column is a variable, and the ijth element of our matrix is a uh, coefficient of that variable in that equation. Any questions? Okay. Representing graphs as a net, as a um, what you call it, uh, a, or a network as a matrix is relatively easy. Typically, if we have a matrix, you know, uh, a square matrix. Element ij would represent the number of edges or the weight of the edges from i to j, okay? So adjacency matrices will do it. Um, and vectors, the things that correspond to kind of movements of things, are logically thought of as a d by one dimensional array. So any column is a vector, any row is a vector. Any questions? Anything else that you can do with matrices that people know of? Okay, fair enough. Okay. Now, once you've got matrices, um, you know, the thing that makes linear algebra a great thing is that there are very, very concise formulas that can be written that express very powerful operations on matrices. Has anyone ever heard of the programming language APL? This, 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 this dates me. But there was a time when APL was this amazing thing that... Uh, certain subgroups of people would use. 
And it had the property that whatever programming you wanted to write, it never took more than one line to write. Okay? Now, the property of it, the reason it did this was it had an alphabet size that was incredible. It used the Greek alphabet and English alphabet and all these other things. And all it really did was matrix operations. So you could build very, very complicated things because every single symbol would be a new matrix operation. And um, so basically, formulas in linear algebra give you the ability to do surprising things. Um, you know, when people prove things in a linear algebra class, okay, you know, you seemingly, I mean, you have this very complicated looking expression, and you can kind of prove that this equals that, usually with a small number of algebraic substitutions. I always found these kind of things very hard to understand. Um, has anybody ever seen a proof like this, that 2 equals 1? Okay, so what is the proof of 2 equals 1? It starts out that A equals B, multiply both sides by A. Uh, now you can, uh, now you're adding, now you're adding, um, all right, you're subtracting B squared from each side. Now when you got this, you can factor this, okay? This gets factored as uh, A plus B times A minus B. Here you just factor out the Bs. Now that you've got an A minus B term on both sides, you can cancel it. You get A, A plus B equals B. Since A equals B, that means 2B equals B. This means 2 equals 1. Okay, and you have a convincing proof of 2 equals 1. What is the problem? Yeah. Dividing, I'm hearing dividing by 0. Where am I dividing by 0? What? A minus B, I am not, there's nothing wrong, wait. Oh, when I, when I divide, when I cancel from here to here, I am dividing by zero, right? Because A equals B. Now, what I want to say, when I look at a proof like this, again, once you've seen, the, seen it, you know it, okay? The first time you saw this one, you were fooled, and I am fooled. This doesn't look like I'm dividing by zero, right? And this is how I always found linear algebra somehow. You're doing a lot of substitutions, but I never really understood <coughs> why I was doing things. And... You know, you've got to be very careful about looking out for special cases like singularities. A singular matrix is one that can't be inverted. Okay, if you try to invert a, a, a singular matrix, it looks just fine in the proof, except for the fact that it doesn't work. So, um, so we've got to be aware of special cases when we're dealing with things. Okay, and so from thinking about that, what I want to do is to try to talk mo today mostly about um, linear algebra, not at the proof level, but at the level of visualizing operations, in the hopes that you guys have had a linear algebra course and that we can uh, look at these things. Okay, so the first geometric thing I'd like people to remember, because it's sometimes useful, is that, that, that points can be represented in D dimensions. Again, we, a lot of the time what we're having is a matrix of numbers. We can view a, a row of a matrix of numbers as a point in however many dimensions it is. Okay, so one way that we can represent a point in D dimensions is as a regular point. Another idea is that we can um, reduce them to points on a sphere. Okay, if you think about it, um, you know, the, if you take the center of your sphere in however many dimensions you're working with, you draw, draw a ray from that through the point, you get a particular direction. And if you scale that thing to, so that the distance of it along that direction is 1, you get a point on a unit sphere, okay? And so another way to represent one, a, uh, to think about a, um, you know, let's say a point, we could think of it as, um, what you call it, uh, you know, as collections of vectors and magnitudes. And sometimes by ignoring the magnitudes, that's actually a useful thing because if we kind of view that each point in a different place is, you know, if, if, we, if we scale it, suddenly all the points are of the same magnitude. And sometimes for certain things we would like to treat all the objects as being the same. Okay, and what really differs from them is a direction. Any questions? That should be clear. Now one property of, um, what you call it, of Thinking about uh, point, points, let's say, as vectors, is it gives us kind of a nat natural way to measure distances between things. Stuff we're going to do later in the semester, we're going to be very interested in 
finding out distances between things. Actually, how many of your projects have a component where you're going to want to find the distance between things? Okay, what do you want to find the distance between? Right. So what you would like to do, what does it mean to say that one actor is similar to another actor? What you would really like to say is if you're representing, if you have a row, a row corresponding to each actor, then in principle, the act of finding which actor is most likely Leonardo DiCaprio is finding which point is it that's closest to Leonardo DiCaprio in space, right? And so a fairly common thing to do is to um, want to compute distances. Sometimes we want to compute things based on magnitudes, okay, where you really measure the distance between points. The other would be one of measuring where you're talking about directions of vectors instead of magnitudes. Can anyone think of why for like that actor similarity? Let's think about it. Why it might be more interesting to compare the distance between two actors as vectors rather than as points. Can anyone think why that might have a different dimension or a different uh, flavor about it? You know, my guess is, again, you have to see what you're doing, but probably the size of somebody's vector is probably a function of how many movies they make, okay, typically, right? If one of these fields is representing, uh, you, know, how you know, how much stuff you're doing, you could imagine that, uh, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio is a point very far from the origin, right, in a particular direction. But Leonardo DiCaprio's brother, who is, hasn't made very many movies, okay, might be very much like Leonardo DiCaprio. We would like the distance between them to be short. It might be that when you scale them both as vectors, suddenly it's the, the, the properties of them that are similar that kind of show off instead of just the, the magnitude of difference. Does everybody kind of get that idea? So sometimes it's useful to think about the, the, uh, the, uh, the distance between vectors. And for this, there is an interesting um, formula that relates the uh, distance between vectors to the angle between them. Okay, so if we have two vectors, okay, the dot product of two vectors is basically, um, you know, if we have two vectors, you know, x1, x2, x3, and y1, y2, y3, the dot product is going to be the sum of xi, yi, okay, for xi goes from 1 to the number of the dimensions. So the dot product, which I guess oh, you guys are probably familiar with that little dot there, okay, is a way of getting a number from it, okay? What's interesting about it? If we take the dot product of two vectors and divide them by their lengths, that represents the cosine of the angle between them. Okay, any questions about that? Now what makes the cosine an interesting thing as far as a similarity measurement? What similarity measurement have we talked about in here that is sort of like a cosine? Okay, well what does a cosine go between? What's the, what, what, when you have an angle that is of, of zero, what is the cosine of that angle? Anyone remember? That's a cosine of 1. What if we have an angle that is like this? What is the cosine of this? 0. And what is it if it's as far apart as possible? Minus 1. What else has the property that when it's very, very similar, it's 1, and when it's as far away as it can be? Correlation. Does everybody see that somehow cosine and our correlation measurements are very closely related. Does everybody kind of get that idea? And in fact, the cosine of the angle between two things is basically the correlation coefficient if the variables have mean, both, both have mean zero, zero. Okay? Any questions about it? So quite often people will talk about doing cosine similarities. Okay. And the reason they're doing that is really in their heart of hearts they are computing correlations. Any questions? Okay, good. Okay, what I'm going to do now is talk about some matrix operations. And I, I've decided that rather than um, view matrices as numbers, 
I find it interesting to view matrices as pictures of things. So you can imagine, what is a picture? A picture is a matrix of numbers. That's another thing that we could do, right? That this is me measuring an amount of, of intensity for, uh, you know, at each point. This is a five, these are all both 512 by 512 pictures. What is this a picture of on the left? Who is this guy? Abraham Lincoln. And who, what's this thing on the right? This is the Abraham Lincoln's memorial. Okay, so if you go to Washington, you visit his memorial. Okay, any questions about it? So we're going to use those as representative examples of a matrix. Okay? When you build linear, matri uh, linear algebra formula, people often talk about the transpose of a matrix. The transpose of a matrix turns the ijth element of the matrix into the jth ith matrix, uh, value of the matrix. So if you have an A times B matrix, the transpose of it is going to be a B times A matrix. Any questions? Why might we want to take the transpose of a matrix? Okay. It's a language to talk about it, but is there some reason why we might want to do it? Okay. In terms of an interpretation or anything like that. One reason is it gives you a way to, to take a matrix and multiply it by itself. Okay? So if we take a look at a matrix, let's say if A and B are different, if it's not a square matrix, if I want to multiply A times itself, can I multiply an A by B matrix against a, 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 an A by B matrix? The answer is no. The transpose is kind of a way to, to reverse the dimensions which, among other things, is often used to get things so that they can multiply together. Any questions? OK, good. Now, with these pictures, one thing I want to say that's going to be true is I'm going to change the values of these things. Notice that with the picture, regardless of how big and large that my numbers are, they're going to rescale before, um, b before you see the next picture. So don't interpret it as being that, the, that this dark color here is necessarily the same as this dark color here. It means that this is the lower intensity than, than this pixel. Any questions? OK, good. Now, um, when you take a matrix and add it to, it, uh, and, and add it to its, um, what you call it, uh, its transposition, does everybody see we get something like that? OK, any questions? That's not so interesting. Sometimes we want to do linear combinations of matrices, where we'll take an, a matrix, multiply it by a scalar, and then add it to another matrix multiplied by a scalar. Why might we want to ever do something like that? What? So more by a scalar will jack up all the values by that, that, that constant, right? Why might we do linear combinations from time to time? OK. Can anyone think of inspired by this? What would be, might be something you would use linear combinations for? I would claim if you were trying to do a, a, a what do we call it, not a, a fading in from one matrix to another. Does everybody see that if I wanted to turn Lincoln into his memorial as a graphic effect, I could do this kind of linear combination. Initially, alpha is 1. And as I change alpha down to 0, it would blend and eventually get the other one out. Any questions? OK. This much, I think, is clear. Now, more interesting than matrix addition is matrix multiplication, OK? So what is the product of matrix multiplication? OK, the product A times B, if I have an, a matrix at N, you know, if we think about it, let's call it X by Y times Y by X, the ijth element of the product is going to be the dot product of the ith row and the kth column. Everybody agree with that? OK? Why does anybody ever want to multiply matrices? OK, I know you've done this kind of operation before and you can do it. Why do you want to multiply matrices? OK. Is there anything that matrix multiplication means? OK. 
So part of what I think, the people I think know how to think about linear algebra, sort of think about what these things mean, okay? And one thing that I would say dot products represent that will kind of help us here a little bit. Dot products, remember, represent how much in sync the values of one row are with, an, with, 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 with the next column, right? We said that the dot product was the same as the cosine. And we said the cosine is a lot like the correlation coefficient. Isn't that right? So what dot products do is measure how much does the ups and downs of this correspond to the ups and downs of that. Any questions? So what can you, OK. And what are the properties of matrix multiplication? This you've probably seen, undoubtedly. Matrix multiplication has the property that you can, it is associative in that you can group the parentheses as you wish to make things simple. So we could parenthesize the first two matrices and multiply them together as opposed to, or, or multiply the second two matrices first and multiply the products by the remaining thing. You will always get the same answer when, it, when, when you group things differently. But you will not get the same answer when you reverse matrices by position. Here we have two square matrices. In principle, we could multiply A times B or B times A. And because it's square, there's not going to be a dimensional problem with that. But we get different answers, OK? Any questions? How do we multiply matrices? What is the comple time complexity of multiplying two matrices together? Is there n by n? n cubed. And why is it n cubed? n squared dot products, and each dot product takes n time. OK, any questions? Now, what's interesting about it is, does anybody know of faster mo algorithms for doing matrix multiplication? Strassen. Say Strassen's. As far as I can tell, nobody do uses Strassen's, OK? But there are faster multiplication algorithms that people use that are, um, very, multi that, that are very numerically stable and, um, and you know, designed to work well for sparse matrices and things like this. So one important point is that whatever your favorite programming language is, there is a linear algebra package that comes with it, OK? And there is a, apparently a very dramatic difference between the complexities of, um, you know, what you call it, the, the, the running times it takes for a well-optimized matrix multiplication routine versus the dumb thing with three loops that you, that you and I both know about. So one consequence is that when we have a lot of linear algebra programs, you know, routines, where, where we're going to need matrix multiplication, learning to use a, a library is a very good thing, OK? I and mean, you can make a difference of 10 in your running time or something like that, just based on, on using a good library. Any questions? OK. Now. Why might we want to multiply a, a, a feature matrix by itself, OK? Suppose we have an n by n uh, data matrix, let's say n by the number of dimensions. If I multiply a, I can multiply a by its transpose. Does everybody agree? I can't multiply a by itself, because an n by d times an n by d matrix isn't compatible, right? But I can multiply an n by d matrix by a d by n matrix. And that, w that would mean a times a t. That would give me an n by n matrix. What is that going to give me? OK? My claim is that if I take an n a matrix by its transpose, every one of the elements is going to be telling me what, how in sync is one row with the other row. Does everybody see? Not one row with the column, OK? This is going to be measuring how much similar is the, it's the ith row of this with the ith column of this. You know, I, I, ij is going to be the ith row of this matrix times the jth column of that. But because it's a transpose, the jth column is really the same as the jth row. Does everybody see that? So A times A is going to give me a measurement, an n by n matrix of dot products, measuring how in sync the items are, right? 
If I take A transpose times A, then I get a D by N matrix times an N by D matrix. I am going to get a D by D matrix, which is going to tell me how in sync are the features with each other. Does everybody see that? The ith, ijth element of this is going to be the ith, the similarity of the ith feature with the jth feature of it. Any questions? This desire to measure the similarity of either rows or columns is common enough that this is, this is a thing we use all the time and we call them covariance matrices. Okay, any questions about them? Okay, so people will talk about them a lot. Yeah. Well, in syncness, what does, what does we, we sort of agreed that um, two points, if we thought of them as dot products, right? Remember, if we think about this as dot products, in sync would, the way I think of what in sync means is that when one value is higher than its mean, the corresponding value is higher than its mean. And when one is lower than its mean, the other one is lower than its mean. In syncness is what I mean by correlation, right? We all agree two variables are correlated if they're in sync, right? If the thing that is bigger for one is bigger than the other, right? In syncness, when we think about it in terms of points, corresponds to two points that have a small angle between them because their dot product is small. Does everybody see that? So kind of what the, what the, cor what the covariance matrix is measuring is somehow a similarity notion. Any question about it? So in this case, if, let's think about it. If we have an n by, if we have n rows in our matrix, and I'm getting an n by n matrix of dot products, I'm getting basically element i j of this matrix is going to be how in sync is the ith row of my matrix A with the jth row of matrix A. Does everybody see that? It's not neighboring rows right now. It's saying that basically this gives me, I can look up any value here will tell me something about how similar each row is. Okay, any questions about that? Yeah. What is the difference between correlation and the dot product? Like in this case, if you... Um, so correlation, I, I, again, if the variables are of unit um, mean, okay, meaning that if the things have been normalized so that everything was of unit mean, the answer is they are the same, okay? If not, then if you think about what the correlation do does, it takes the um, dot product and, the, and then it basically normalizes it, divides it sort of by the magnitude of these things. So basically, correlation and cosine are basically the same thing, okay? Or certainly very similar things. Any questions? Okay. So which of these is the, co here's the Lincoln Memorial on this side. Which of these is the correlation of the row, is the covariance matrix of the rows, and which is the covariance matrix of the columns? Okay. Okay. Taking a look at this one over here. Is this the covariance matrix of the rows or the column, of the matrix or the columns of the matrix? Rows of the matrix, right? What's that saying if you look at it here? This band from here to here, any pair of these rows is very similar, right? And so we get a very high value for the, uh, what you call it, a constant and high value for the, I guess actually if, if, if dark means, um, what you call it, low, then maybe we get a very low value here, right? Because there's a lot of dark things being multiplied by dark things, right? If you look at over here, these values, here we have for these rows, okay, against these rows, that's this sort of section of the matrix. And this is also very, this is very, very light. Why is this? Because every one of these stairs is very much like every one of the other stairs, right? But maybe this is a brighter image on average. That's why this region has a different color than that. Any questions? And does everybody see that this is a, a, a covariance matrix for the columns? 
again, if we look at this thing, every, there, there's kind of this banded structure. Every column that goes through a real column of the, of the, of the, the memorial is very similar. Does everybody see that? And so that's why we end up getting that for every, uh, you know, every pair of column to column things, those are very, very similar. Any questions about that? Okay. Is the covariance matrix symmetric or not symmetric? Let's think about it. Okay. Is it true that the ijth element of the covariance matrix has to equal the jith element of a covariance matrix? Okay, that's what it would mean to be symmetric. By symmetric, I mean symmetric of down the diagonal. Does everybody see that there's kind of a main diagonal here? Okay. Um, does this have to be symmetric? The answer is yes, because the dot product of i times of, of, of i times j, r uh, row i times j, is the same as the dot product of j times i. Does everybody agree with that? And why do we see this 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 band here? This this this. Does anybody see the main diagonal here? Why do we see the main diagonal there? Okay, so how many people see the dust? Maybe my figure is, maybe we've got a better resolution display here. If you look at this carefully, you can see there's a line. Can anybody see the line here that corresponds to the main diagonal? And that looks like it's dark. Why is that dark? Because every, every, every vector is going to be very much in sync with itself. Does everybody see that? But on the other hand, there's a question again as to how, whether it's unusually bright or unusually dark is going to determine the color here. Any questions? Okay, any question about what a covariance matrix is? Yeah. If the veil, okay, so if the, if, the, if the value of the dot product is high, they should be more similar. Why is that? That's whenever this thing is being multiplied by, a big number is being multiplied by a big number, it's going to be big. I mean, th think about what could happen here. If we have a big number, let's say we have 100 and 1 and 100 and 1. The dot product here is going to be very large, 100 squared plus 1, right? If we reverse this thing, 100 times 100 plus 100 times 100 is small, right? Most of the array value is going to come when we have a big thing multiplied by a big thing. Okay? Any questions? That's what I mean by being in sync. Okay? Any questions? Okay, good. What else can we do with matrix multiplication? So matrix multiplication lets us compute covariance measures and measure the similarity of rows and columns. Matrix multiplication also lets us count the number of, if we had 0, 1 matrices, Matrix multiplication lets us count the number of paths of length two. Suppose I take a matrix I, a, a matrix, a square matrix, and multiply it by itself. Let's say it's a graph. It's representing a, a network, okay? If there is a path of length two between elements I and K, okay, the claim would be that that means that there is a, a, an edge from I to, to J and an edge from j to k. Does everybody agree that if there's a path of length 2 from i to j, okay, to k, that would mean there had to be an intermediate vertex j such that, um, what you call it, that there's an, a, a, an edge from i to j and an edge from j to k. That's what it means to have a path of length 2, right? When you take the adjacency matrix and you multiply it, uh, the values that you're going to get are basically the number of paths of length two at each spot. Okay, so it tells you something about how networks work. Any questions? Another thing that matrices do, when you have a matrix of zeros and ones, there's a special class of matrices that are uh, called permutation matrices, where every row and every column has exactly one, a one one in it. Does everybody see it? It's a zero one matrix. And if we look at this one, every row here has one, every column has one. 
Okay? Any questions? What's the most famous permutation matrix of all? Anybody? The identity matrix, right? What is that one? That's one where all the ones lie on the main diagonal. Is that right? And what's interesting about it is when, what happens when you multiply a matrix by its identity? What do you get? The matrix, okay? What happens when you multiply a matrix by a permutation uh, 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 matrix? It basically rearranges the rows and columns, okay? But otherwise leaves the elements intact. Any questions? And this turns out to be part of the useful, a, a useful thing when it comes to writing very short linear algebra formula that do complicated things. If we take the right permutation matrix, we can rearrange our elements arbitrarily without having loops that actually do the uh, rearrangement. Any questions? So one programming trick that is a surprising thing, if I had to take a, um, a, a uh, element, a matrix, and permute the rows and the columns, the natural thing for me as a programmer would be to, to say, okay, you know, I can write a program to do it. If you make the permutation matrix and do matrix multiplication, high performance matrix multiplication routines are very, very good at that kind of thing. So my students always tell me, are amazed by how much they speed up their programs by removing nested loops where they had things and replace it by matrix multiplication things, okay? Because it's very optimized. Okay, so we can use matrix multiplication to rearrange things. We can use matrix multiplication to rotate things in space. Does everybody kind of remember this thing? That point, this kind of, we represent um, vectors or, or, you know, rows of a matrix or columns of a matrix can be thought of as points. When you multiply the matrix, it kind of, can, it, by an appropriate matrix, it takes one point and moves it to another place. If you multiply things by the right matrix, you can have the effect of rotating things, okay? Any questions? And the cool thing, I guess, about linear algebra is that a lot of things that kind of I understand in two dimensions, like rotation, naturally generalize to arbitrary dimensions, okay? So now, how do, how do I rotate something in two dimensions? Well, I know how to do this. How do I rotate something in 200 dimensions? This I have a hard time thinking about but it's basically just a generalization by analogy of the same kind of thing. Any questions? Okay, so that's rotations. Now, if we want to multiply matrices, we may also want to think, can we divide matrices? You guys all know about matrix multiplication. Do you know anything about dividing matrices? Taking one matrix and dividing it by another. It's not usually talked about like that. But you do know about matrix inversion you've probably heard about, right? What is the inverse of a matrix? Uh, a matrix A has an inverse A to the minus 1. If I can take that matrix and multiply it by, its, uh, by the inverse, I get the identity matrix. Does everybody see that? That's what it means to t for, uh, uh, so for, you know, any square matrix with, uh, you know, reasonable properties, there is an inverse for it. Okay? And so we can take any matrix and find another matrix that multiplying it by itself gives us the inverse. Okay? Any questions? So what does that have to do with um, multiplying? What if I take, um, what you call it, this formula and multiply it, again, it, it's kind of like if you think about it, if I multiply it by um, 1 over A, okay? I mean, again, basically, if you think about it, this kind of a formula is sort of equivalent to putting, if you were doing normal kinds of algebra with regular kinds of things, you would say, oh, I can divide both sides by 1 over A. If so, it kind of seems that the inverse of A is really the identity over A itself. Okay, so there's kind of a, a close connection between the idea of what people talk about inverses and people talk about is dividing matrices. Any questions? Okay, so um, good. How do we compute the inverse of a matrix? Okay, we agree the, the inverse has this property that it's kind of related to division. Okay, 
How do we take a matrix and find its inverse? Does anybody remember? OK, so one way you could do it is some fancy formula that you learned, OK? Something like transpose times the divided by the determinant. That's good. That's what this is doing, right? The other more general way to do it has to do with linear system solving. Remember Gaussian elimination and solving equations by, um, by linear algebra? Basically, if you take a um, matrix and you append to it the identity matrix, and then do row and column on the operations on this to create the uh, identity matrix on the left-hand part. If you do the same operations on the right-hand part as you're doing the left-hand part, this basically turns out to be the inverse. Okay? Any questions? So to find the inverse of a matrix is like any of these linear algebra things that you guys learned about system solving. How much time does it take to solve a linear system? Does anyone remember of an n by n uh, matrix? How much time does that take to solve the linear system? OK, you say what? Say linear time? No. Does anyone remember how solving a linear system worked? Basically, if I am remembering it, OK, and I'm kind of bad, was that, uh, that I would uh, in you know, have to, I guess, divide my thing so that, uh, I guess in general, if I have a matrix that I'm trying to, to do, right? If I had this matrix, if I wanted to isolate this variable, that was kind of the basic thing that I had to do, right? I had to divide this by the thing so that this became one, basically, right? And then I had to add this one to each of these. Does everybody see that? So how much time am I, what am I doing? To isolate this variable, I am basically adding, okay, something to each one of the other operation, to each of the other elements in my matrix, right? Does everybody see that? How much time does it take to isolate that one variable? N squared. Does everybody see that? That I'm basically taking these n terms and you know, figuring out what, the, what I have to multiply them by and then subtract them, right? So I'm doing something that takes n squared time n times. Does everybody see it? So solving a linear system takes n cubed time. Does everybody remember that now? And that means that solving a linear system is basically the same kind of thing as doing a matrix multiplication. Any questions? Okay. And what this kind of shows is that you can find the inverse in the same n cubed time. Any questions? OK, good. Now, this is Lincoln, and this is his inverse. OK? Does anybody see anything of Lincoln in his inverse? I don't see any, any Lincoln there anymore, right? But there's clearly there, because when you multiply Lincoln times his inverse, what do you get? You get basically the identity matrix, right? And you may be thinking, well, what's that gray stuff that is back here? Okay? This is called numerical error, okay? Does everybody kind of rem realize that when you're doing numerical operations, there are precision issues in doing numerical computations? Okay? And, um, and you know, it, we usually ignore this kind of thing. But, in fact, um, you know, a lot of what is involved in doing computations in linear algebra, building a good linear algebra package, is trying to arrange the computation so you minimize the amount of numerical error that you get. Any questions about that? Any questions about the inverse here? Okay, good. And as I said, what is good is that uh, basically to compute, do a matrix inversion is the same as solving a system of linear equations. OK? One should be here that if you take a look at this one, if we ha know that AX equals B, this is what we mean by a linear system, right? You've got a matrix A that is representing the equations, a matrix B that is representing the values of that equation, right? For each equation, if you're saying that 3X plus 2Y plus 10Z equals 56, the 
coefficients are A and the 56, the, the Y values, or this are matrix B. If we know that AX equals B by definition, if we multiply both sides by the inverse of A, what do we get? A times A inverse is going to be the identity matrix, right? The identity matrix times X is going to be what? X. So this basically says that X is equal to A inverse times B, which means that once you have computed the inverse, if you want to actually find the values of the point for any particular target set of target values B, it's just multiplying it by the inverse. Does everybody kind of get that idea? So we could solve linear equations by doing Gaussian elimination. Or if we want to solve a compute, evaluate a set of linear equations where we keep the coefficient matrix the same but change the target values, we are better off than, than doing the, um, what you call it, compute the inverse and then just do multiplication repeatedly with that inverse, okay? Because that would then be faster than uh, solving the system each time. Any questions? Okay, so that should be clear. Now, when I did my proof that 2 was equal to 1, the key to making that work was dividing by 0, as you guys noticed, right? And um, all the operations on systems of equations kind of are assuming that my rows of my matrix are all kind of different from each other. If I have two rows that are the same thing, I end up getting, you know, basically it's the situations that are comparable to dividing by zero, okay? And so what we say here is that the rank of a matrix is the number of linearly independent rows, meaning rows you can't make up by sums and, and a, you know, a scalar multiplication and sums of other rows. Okay? And ideally, if you have a good n by n matrix, okay, all the rows should be independent of each other. All the rows would be different than you. But uh, if so, then, then the matrix should have rank n. Most of the linear algebra operations are going to be of rank n. Okay? You know, assume that the matrix is of rank n. Any questions? But who here has a data matrix that they built? Okay, I heard the IMDB, the movie people, were building a matrix, right? What kind of features are you going to have in your, in your, um, ma in your ma data matrix? Number of movies, what other? So, kind of like genre of actor, things like this, okay? Is there any reason why two actors can't have the same row, can't define the same feature vector? Okay, where basically there are two actors that, that, you know, if we think about, let's say, this IMDB world, where there's a row for every um, actor and a column for every feature of them, do we think that this is going to be a full rank matrix or not? Okay, and usually it's not really true. This is kind of a warning to people for one problem that you guys may have when you start working with these things is that often there are actors that are basically going to look, rows that are going to look the same in feature space. Does everybody see that? And if so, then, then the matrix is not a full rank thing, okay? And so fairly often we do have this problem that if you naively apply these graph algorithms, you know, these, these matrix algorithms to it, you will discover that your, 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 your thing is underdetermined. So for example, when I took the Lincoln Memorial if we remember back to the Lincoln Memorial picture, okay, are each of the rows here linearly independent of each other? And, you know, to looking at it, I can't tell. But I can tell you that when you compute the rank, okay, using a, uh, a routine, okay, then in fact there were only 508 different rows, okay? The rank was 508 instead of 512. How can you take a matrix and increase its rank? Okay, if you have a feature, let's think about your problem now. Okay, if you have t uh, a, 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 a data matrix where certain rows are not linearly independent of other rows, 
What can you do with it about it? One possibility is to add noise to the data, to the matrix, right? If you add random noise to it, it will probably, the, the problem will go away. Um, but is that a good thing to do? It's probably not the best thing to do. What would be another thing to do? In the case of this poor guy with his feature, what else would you, might you do? What? Well, I don't know about normalization. Might be adding more features, right? What else might he do? Well, making things up, making things up is adding random noise, right? Adding more features that you didn't bother to add the first time is not making things up, right? What's another way that he could do it? Well, it's, it's not, you're not going to change the, re, the, the, the rank of the matrix by reversing columns. So shuffling the columns isn't going to change it. Okay, that's not going to make the problem go away. Any other way we can make that go away? Well, some of these algorithms that we're going to be using are going to be assuming that the matrix is a full rank matrix in order to run. Yes. Okay. So, you know. So what might happen here? Okay, another thing that he could do with his case, if he says that the actors, you know, Skeena, Smolka, and Stoller were all the same in feature space, one possibility is once he's identified that, to remove two of them and give, you know, say that there's really just one guy here with three different names. Does everybody kind of see that? At that point, you may want to remove some of the rows, okay, and re-give them other names is another possibility. Does everybody see that? Okay. So bottom line is when you, sometimes when you work with these linear algebra routines, you will try to do something with it. It will fail, and it will complain that the thing is not full rank. Okay. And these would be the kind of solutions you would have to avoiding that. Any questions? Okay, good. Now, one thing that's related to division, okay, is this idea of factoring. What does factoring a number mean? When I take a number, what, do I, what does it mean to factor a number? To take my number and re express it as the product of two other numbers. Does everybody see that? In, for matrices, we could imagine a world where we might want to factor a matrix that's n by m called A. Suppose we factored it into matrices B and C, such that B times C equals A. Okay? Now, what do we know about the dimensions of B and C? If our n by a, a is an n by m matrix, what is the dimensions of B going to be? n by something. Let's call that something k. If this thing is n by k, what do we know about c? k by n. Does everybody see that? OK. So what is a good thing about factoring it? Suppose k is very small. OK? Suppose we could factor a matrix A into products n times k and k times n, k by m. And k was very small. Does everybody see that matrix A took n times m numbers? If k was small, n times, it's now going to be, the numbers we're going to need are going to be n plus m times k, right? If k is small relative to n and m, we would be compressing, OK? The, we would come up with our, our matrices B and C would be a compressed representation. Does everybody see that? So one thing that a lot of machine learning algorithms talk about doing is factoring matrices. And I always hear this, what is factoring matrices? Why do you want to factor a matrix? The real reason is because they can kind of create compressed representations of your data. OK? So let's look at a, 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 um, an example here. 
One common class of problems is, let's say, in let's say trying to recognize whether documents are similar or doing a lot of language modeling. You could imagine a world where you build, if you have a corpus of a large number of documents, so that each row is a document, and you can represent each document as a bag of words. So the, the, the columns of this document are going to be the um, vocabulary words, okay? And we could imagine then representing each document as a point in space representing how many times it had each word in it. Does everybody see that? Okay. I think this is a useful representation. Everybody kind of get this idea? So first of all, this should show you, we could now think of every document is now a row in word space, right? And notice that, um, remember I was talking about the difference between measuring points, the distance between points as similar points, as, as points by Euclidean distance versus angle? What would it be if we had two documents, let's say two, uh, one book was Skeena's algorithms book, and the other one was Skeena's algorithms book concatenated to Skeena's algorithms book. Does everybody see that? Okay, so you can imagine a world where you had a book, one was a book, and another was a book which they, was repeated twice. Does everybody see that? What would this look like? What would be the difference between these rows in word, um, in, in sort of word co-occurrence matrix space? Does everybody see that the second row would be twice the first row? How far apart would they be as points in space? Not a constant distance from each other. What would that look like in feature space? Same angle, but different magnitude. You kind of think that's going to happen if this is your world of the space, right? There is going to be a world where this is Skeener's algorithm's book is sitting out there. Double Skeena, which looks twice as good, is going to be here. Does everybody see that? How far apart are those points going to be? Well, in terms of Euclidean distance, as you know, your, your Euclidean distance is your square root of a squared plus b squared, right? Are they going to be close? Not really. Okay. And triple Skeena would be even further out. Does everybody see that? But as, me as measuring them as vectors, are they similar? Yeah, they would both be about, clearly they're both algorithm -y books, right? And so this is why sometimes you want to, I think this is now should be compelling as to why sometimes you want to compare them as vectors if you want to find similar things. Comparing them as vectors, which are essentially normalized points, right? So all the points lie the same distance from the origin. Comparing them by angle may be a better notion of similar similarity than Euclidean space. Any questions? Okay, that should be con convincing. But what happens when you factor a matrix? So suppose we took a look at this document by word matrix, and we factor it so that we have a word by k matrix. Uh, uh, this would be a document by k matrix times a k by number of words in the vocabulary matrix. What good is that? OK. So one thing you're saying, oh, look, it's less space than this. That's one thing I guess that's good. But what's more important than that? It's not just that it's less space. Okay, I want to claim that this now is a very compact matrix that represents the documents. Does everybody see this? Every row here is still a document, right? Presumably, if this matrix times this captures this thing, each row of this matrix, the similarity of the rows probably has something to do with the similarity of the rows between these kind of things. Does everybody see that? So this gives us a matrix about documents that is a compressed verse form of it, right? 
and probably quite useful. Okay, maybe useful in other things, right? Maybe if you, you know, if you want everyone to find similar documents, this is probably a better place to start than this high complex matrix thing. And what is this other matrix over here? This is going to be a K by the number of words matrix. What good is that? It probably is true that since you have, since these word matrices go a lot to figuring out the document thing, I'm going to claim that words that are probably very similar, here a word that would be similar, two words that would be similar would probably appear in, in, in documents that were similar. Does everybody kind of get that idea? So what are two words that are similar, okay? You know, let's say baseball and cricket, right? They're both about, you know, hitting things with ball, with sticks, right? And so you can imagine that some documents are about sports, and they will probably talk about cricket and baseball, right? Likewise, if we take a look at this thing, I claim we get a comp compressed feature vector about words, okay? that can be used outside this application. Does everybody see? Now I've got a very portable, um, what do you call it, feature representation about words I can use for anything I want. Okay? So factoring matrices gives us a way to identify interesting features if we can factor it. Any questions about that? Yeah? What about the cost of x value big matrices? What? Cost of uh, x value when big matrices. Okay, so now the problem is that factoring a big matrix is a hard thing, okay? So I'm not going to tell you exactly how to factor big matrices. But it should be clear that factoring matrices is something we should want to do. That's kind of what I want to convince you guys of, okay? That factoring matrices is a great way to produce compressed features, which turn out to be a good thing. Why might it be better to build a document similarity measure on the compressed features rather than on the full features? Reduce time. Well, it might, might be reduced time, okay, because once we're in here, if we now want to compare a new document to all these other things, if I have the compressed version, it's shorter. That would be, you're right that that's probably faster. What else is it? Um, documents in terms of word independent from each other, maybe, okay. What I want to claim is that kind of if we, this is really going to be built by kind of collapsing all the rows, all the words, in the document case, all the words that are very, very similar are kind of going to sort of maybe kind of collapse into one column, okay? So it's maybe a more um, robust kind of a thing. It's a small number of features that encodes a lot of this other thing. It should be kind of robust in ways that similarity isn't. Right? Like, if we had one column here representing sports words, then cricket and baseball would all get tossed into the same category, right? And they'd light up the same thing. And documents referring to each would be kind of sports things. Okay? So bottom line is if we can factor matrices, this is a good thing. Another thing is that if we were building a model on these things, notice a model on these would have K parameters where a model on this thing is going to have n parameters. Does everybody see that? And the more coefficients you need, the more complicated the model is, and the less likely it's going to, you know, it's good. It's easier to train and quite possibly more accurate and more robust with smaller numbers of dimensions. But the first one you're claiming is like the linear, fact, linear factorizing these matrices, and the first one you're saying is the book uh, matrix. Yeah, this would be a book's matrix. Implicitly remaining. It's not like they it's not like we're dropping the rows that don't mean the columns that don't mean as much to us. Yeah. But kind of typically in the course of factoring, somehow we're coming up with a smaller number of pseudo words that kind of encodes this thing, right? And those pseudo words are presumably collapsing words of similar meaning in some way. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so this is an interesting point. If I took a look at this and you said, um, 
you know, uh, you classified, let's say you, you took the word go occurrence matrix and, um, uh, and, and you said that, uh, let's say you wanted to classify Skeena's book into something. And you say Skeena's book is about sports. And I say, what? It's not about sports. You could, you could come up with why, you, you would say, prove to me why it was about sports. And you would be able to figure out what feature here triggered it. And that would be corresponding to what word was it. Maybe I use the word win a lot, okay? Or maybe I use some other word that sometimes appears in sports content. You would understand it. If you're working on these implicit dimensions, these implicit dimensions don't have names anymore. That's what he's really saying, right? Each one of these things had a name of a word. Here they don't have words. So when working with the compressed features, the good thing is that we have um, less features that might be more robust. The truth is, though, we don't know, know what these features mean anymore. Does everybody see, get, see that? Okay, so that's, that's part of life, okay? And it's kind of upsetting. You do want, it would be great if we had names for these so we could blame them or talk about them, but we really don't know. Yeah? Right, so recognize that maybe, let's say in the first one, let's say that we were going to come up with a book, a, a classifier to decide whether or not a book was a book about sports. And maybe you could imagine a classifier that did the following. It was of the form, the sum as i goes from one to the number of words of the coefficient of the ith word times the frequency of the ith word, okay? This is a linear model, and if it's greater than zero, maybe we would decide that it's a sports book. Okay, could you imagine a, a linear model like this? And now, uh, you know, if so, book words that correspond to things in sports, like what's, what are words that correspond to things in sports? Baseball is a word about sports. Football, hit, tackle, you know, um, score, right? Teams. You could imagine that the coefficients of those words would be higher, right? And so if we wanted to tell a, a sports book from a non-sports book, okay, you could imagine training a model where the coefficients of the sports-related terms were high. And what are book words that would never appear in a sports book? I don't know if anybody can think of a word that couldn't possibly. What word couldn't? Dynamic programming, okay, or uh, algorithm or sort of. Well, you know, some anyway. Let's say dynamic programming couldn't appear in the sports book, right? And so that would be at a negative weight. Does everybody see that? Now, let's say we did the same thing on our compressed word matrix. Now the model is going to look very much the same. Okay. But now each column is no longer has a name on it. Does everybody see it? We could train a model like this, and we would get a highest coefficient for what turned out to be, let's say, the fourth column in our matrix. But it's not readily interpretable as, you know, sports things the same way it was in uh, the, the word case. That's the point that he's kind of making, okay? So in fact, today we'll talk uh, 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 about other ways that we're going to compress matrices. The thing that we lose is we lose what the, the dimensions mean. We, we hope and have good reason to believe they mean something, but we don't know what they mean the way that we did before. Any questions? Yeah. OK, so what is the second matrix? This is going to be the number of documents times k. This is k times the number of words, the words, right? So each column here represents a word. It kind of makes sense that if this word matrix is supposed to represent all the words that were used in these documents, then viewing the transpose of this, we would have a feature matrix. If we transpose this matrix, we would have a k-dimensional thing, representation for each word. Does everybody see it? Each column here corresponds to a word. And it should make sense that if somehow these things are working together to make up the, the word document occurrence matrix, 
then probably words that are very similar in terms of their meaning or their roles in life are going to be similar in this space. Okay? And so that's why, and sometimes by factoring it, we got two sets of matrices. Here, features for the documents and features for the words. Okay? That depending on what we want to do might be good, might not be good. Any questions? Okay? So that's why people talk about factoring matrices. Any questions? Now, unfortunately, factoring matrices in general is hard. Hard, I'm not going to, I mean, difficult, uh, ill-defined, can't always do it, yada, yada. Okay? But there are certain kinds of matrices that can be factored, or certain ways to factor matrices that you probably saw in your linear algebra course. Okay? That now we, sh we have some respect for, because now we have a reason why we want to factor matrices. Right? One of them was LU decomposition. Does anyone remember hearing about that? That would ma multiply a matrix, okay? It was a way to represent a matrix as the product of two triangular matrices, right? And this had all kinds of other magic properties, okay? The determinant of the matrix turned out to be a product of the diagonal elements of U, okay? And as we said before, there was a connection between determinants and rank. So one way to figure out whether or not all your rows were in a, independent involved computing this, this decomposition. But what is interesting? Here we had um, a matrix. We, we, we took our matrix of the Lincoln Memorial. Here is the low L, the lower triangular matrix. This thing up here is the upper triangular matrix, okay? L times U gives us this. Does this look like the Lincoln Memorial? Kind of. What's different about it? The, 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 it it's actually the rows are permuted. Does everybody kind of see it? There's plenty of column rows here and plenty of other things. Why is it that the LU decomposition solver permuted the rows? Can anybody remember, think about why that was? Okay. Do anyone remember why you do LU decomposition in a matri of matrices? Anyone remember what, what the reason was? What? Reduce the rank of the matrix. It had to do with solving systems. It was a way of solving linear systems quickly, right? If you have a linear system solver, uh, linear systems, does it matter if you reverse the rows, uh, two rows in a, in, a, in a matrix of equations? No. So this solver was very happy. It was, it was assuming you wanted to do this on equations, right? And so it, for, for reasons of numerical stability or whatnot, it chose the, had the convenience of, of permuting the rows, right? So that's kind of why this thing happened, okay? But of course, you could have reconstructed that if you wanted. Any questions? So, um, so basically, um, factorization is a good thing, okay? Any questions about matrix factorization? Why it's a good thing. The last topic I'd like to talk about today Okay, is has to do with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, again, this was sort of you probably do remember at least the terms from your linear algebra course. What was an eigenvalue or an eigenvector? Does anyone remember? Okay, it was some complicated thing you had to deal with that was messy. Okay. Okay, so you're describing how to do it as some this, this, to, to calculate these things. There was a determinant of lambda minus something or other. What is interesting about eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Basically, it, it, it breaks down to being this kind of a thing. Here we have a matrix. You'll notice it's the same matrix here. If we multiply this matrix times this vector, that it happens to be the same as this vector times a, con a scalar, okay? And if we look at this particular thing, here we have a different vector. Does everybody see that? And this vector times a different scalar. 
is equal to the same matrix A times that vector. Does everybody see it? So the property of an eigenvalue eigenvector pair for a matrix is that the matrix times the vector is the same as the eigenvalue times the vector. Okay? Which, if you at least on a some meta level, what does that mean? That means somehow if this side is going to equal that side, on some meta level, this vector and this constant scalar in some sense represents a lot about the original matrix. Does everybody kind of see it? You need this big matrix multiplied by this to get this. That matrix is somehow reducible largely to this vector and this thing. Okay? So the interesting property of eigenvalues and eigenvectors are that they enable us to break a matrix into n pairs of constants, of scalars, and vectors that together represent basically that matrix. Any questions about that? That was why we cared about these kind of things. Okay. So what are the properties of eigenvalues that make them interesting to us? Okay. One is that, again, if we have an n by n matrix of full rank, it's got n, n pairs of vectors and, and values. Okay. These eigenvectors have the property that they are mutually orthogonal. Okay? And if people remember that, what does that mean? If you look at um, axes, in, let's say two axes in a plane, the direction of this is uh, in the y direction is completely orthogonal. It has nothing to do with the direction in the x plane. Does everybody see that? And in fact, you could represent x and y planes as kind of being, you know, the vectors 0, 1, and 1, 0. The dot product of these things, this is the x axis, this is, this is the x axis, this is the y axis. The dot product of this is going to be 0, right? That's the definition of what it means to be orthogonal. And what's interesting, though, is that eigenvectors basically play the same role as axes as far as I'm concerned, in higher dimensional space, because the property uh, is that for any pair of eigenvectors, their dot product is 0. If you notice, 2 times 1 plus minus 1 times 2 is 0, right? So one reason we're going to care about um, what you call it. Uh, um, we're going to care about eigenvectors, is that they kind of will enable us to think about them as being axes in some, some spa higher dimensional space. Any questions? Okay, good. And again, how do you find these eigenvalues and eigenvectors? There are different algorithms that are basically related to solving linear systems, sort of like that determinant minus lambda routine thing. Okay? But let's assume we can now find these things. Any questions? Okay. What is interesting about eigenvalues? Okay? One interesting thing is that if you have a symmetric matrix, okay, an n by n symmetric matrix, we can decompose it into eigenvector products. What does this mean? Okay? If we have an n by n matrix, an eigenvector is what? That is going to be an n by 1 vector. Does everybody see that? That's what a vector is, right? What is the transpose of a vector going to be? A 1 by n thing. Does everybody see that? And what happens when you multiply a 1 by n thing by an n by 1 thing by a 1 by n thing? What do you get? n by n thing. Does everybody see that? So when you see this ui, ui transpose thingy, what this is saying is, I am turning my vector, each vector, into an n by n matrix, right? I am, lambda i is the corresponding eigenvalue, right? And there's this am amazing 